depression
morning, Westwood Church. Would you stand and sing with us, please?
Good morning, Westwood Church. Welcome to worship at Westwood, and we want to just take a moment and say thank you to all of those of you who served in uniform, who are serving in uniform, who have loved ones who have or are serving. We recognize the fact that the very fact that we can gather together today, just freely choose to come to a worship service or watch a worship service online, as I know many of you are doing, is really because we had people and have people who are willing to, to stand up for us. And so we just say thank you and uh, want to make sure that we acknowledge and remember that. So thanks for being here, and thank you to all of you who have given so much. Hey, want to my name is Scott Christensen. I'm the senior pastor here at Westwood Church, and I want to remind you this morning that we are uh, always wanting to check in. So if you have uh, your cell phone with you, and you dial 402-518-9904, what you do is in the text box you need to type in one of those codes whichever one is most appropriate for you and those of you who who are here please do that those of you who are watching on live stream at home please do this it's a way that we can make sure we stay connected in this time of our lives so would really encourage you to do that go ahead and check in just do it right now it's perfectly fine for you to get your phone out and do that right now and if you're a guest here this morning which means it's your first or second or third time here be sure and check in because we want to just get a little information from you and we want to tell you a little bit about Westwood Church. It's just our way of uh, kind of introducing ourselves to each other. So I encourage you to do that. Hey, uh, today we are going to finish up our series that we call Official. We're talking about the different roles that Jesus plays uh, throughout the history of Scripture and in our lives and in our church. And today we're going to talk about the last one. We're going to talk about Jesus as Good Shepherd. Um, so we're excited to uh, be able to talk a little bit about that and think about that from one of my favorite passages of Scripture, John chapter 10. So really should be a good time. I'm really glad you're here. One of the things we always do at Westwood is turn a bit of our time over to kids. And Miss Michelle is here. All right, thank you. Good morning, boys and girls. It's nice to see a bunch of you in here. We don't have Sunday school. We get to see you to see you. Okay, so Pastor Scott said we're talking about the Good Shepherd today, Jesus as our Good Shepherd. So I want to see what you know about sheep today, all right? True or false about sheep? Thumbs up for true, thumbs down for false. All of you can play along. Here we go. Sheep have an excellent sense of smell. True or false? I see lots of falses. Lots of false. It's actually true. And I found out that they have scent glands in front of their eyes and on their feet. I know, I didn't know that either. Okay, I got you already. Next one, girl sheep are called rams, and boy sheep are called ewes. Ooh, lots of falses over here. That is false. I said them just opposite, didn't I? The boys are the rams, the girls are the ewes. Good. I tried to trick you. Fail. Uh, there are over one billion, with a B, sheep in the world. Micah, you're right. There are one billion. Oh, my goodness. That surprised me. Okay, sheep eat mostly plants, but they will also eat meat. Ah, all over the place. That is false. They do not eat meat. They are herbivores. Very good. Um, a person who watches over the sheep is called a cowboy or a cowgirl. Oh, everybody knows. That's false. Who, what is a person called who watches over sheep? Shepherd. Good. And the last one is about a shepherd. A good shepherd will lay down their own life to protect their sheep. And obviously in the Bible, in John 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, my sheep know me, and I will lay down my life for my sheep. And guess who the sheep are? Us. Yes, good news for us today. Let's thank God for that today. Can you put your hand on your heart, kids? Good job, let's talk to him. God, we thank you for Jesus, the good shepherd who did lay down his life for us. We're so blessed. Thank you for doing that for us, for being our good shepherd. And all God's kids said, amen. Hey, up through pre-K, we do have rooms for you. If you would like to go play, you can find. 
follow me out. Thanks, Miss Michelle. And all the rest of you, stand up and say hi to somebody next to you, will you? Continue worshiping this morning as we sing Savior like a shepherd. think about Jesus as the good shepherd, I'm pretty sure that for lots of us anyway, maybe for those of us who grew up in the church, there's a psalm that comes to the mind. Of course, that's the 23rd psalm. And I thought this morning, reminding us of the traits of our good shepherd, we might say this uh, psalm together responsively. It'll be pretty clear who says what when. So join me, will you? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is our shepherd. And we shall not. Before 
I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathe your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming and never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah. I was your foe, still your love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. When I feel no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. me down fights till I found reason I deny and I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it still you give yourself away and all the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. To me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't get down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick it down, lie you won't tear it up, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm from leaves and I denied. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. You give yourself away Know the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of
O oh, great shepherd of the sheep, you who are our good shepherd, you have been so, so good to us. So, so kind, so, so merciful, so, so grace-filled. And we know that we could never do this by ourselves. That without you, we would be lost, wandering alone, in peril. And yet, when we follow you, we are safe. Even in the toughest terrain, we are safe. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, your kindness to us. Amen. Have a seat for me, will you? A couple of announcements, a few things that are going on in the life of our um, First of all, if you brought an offering with you this morning, a physical offering, there's a box right out there in the gathering space, says offering on it, conveniently enough, and you can put it right in there and we'll take care of it from there, but if you'd like to give online, that's a really easy, great way to do it. You just go to westwoodchurch.net and there's a donation tab that'll walk you right through the whole process. It's, it's super easy and very convenient and... Uh, I encourage you to go that route if you can, if you feel comfortable doing that. And just know that we are so grateful for all the donations this congregation makes. Uh, during this COVID time, you have been very, very generous. And we are thankful for that. Hey, social distancing update. Um, some of this you, uh, we are implementing even today. Um, masks in church are now optional. Some people have actually looked at me and asked me to wear a mask uh, for other reasons besides uh, COVID, I think. But generally, they're optional. Um, and then we are going to, for our educational areas, so things that, are, that happen in classrooms and our youth rooms, we're going to follow the middle of public school guidelines, whatever they are. Um, so we're just kind of keeping track of those. So just know that uh, if you are wondering, well, does my child need to wear a mask? Do I, if I'm teaching, need to wear a mask? Watch the Miller public school guidelines, and we'll follow those. Um, and if we're going to vary from those, we'll let you know that. And then just know that for our coming VBS, which comes in a couple of weeks now, um, masks will be required for five and up. We're going to do masks one more session of that. So just to let you know about that. Sunday school begins June 13th, uh, our summer Sunday school. And they have great things that are planned for that. So just know that that's coming. So mark that on your calendars. And the most maybe important announcement I'll make all day, coffee service begins at Westwood Church again. The, the Sunday after Vacation Bible School. And it's only for those people who volunteer in Vacation Bible School. You're the only ones who will get coffee. <laughs> Michelle, your volunteer rate just went way up. <laughs> Crazy. So I want to make sure you're aware of that also. Hey, lastly, um, our high school, middle school ministries have an envelope fundraiser going on. Where they, they haven't been able to do their normal fundraiser kind of stuff this year. So we, uh, they came up with this idea, and I think it's a great one. Here's how it works. Right outside in the gathering space, along that wall over there, on the left side of the chapel, as you're looking at the chapel, you can see a whole bunch of envelopes. What we're going to ask you to do is just pick one of those envelopes that, that with an amount you want to donate, and there's some instructions in there that will tell you how, to, how to, to give to that. Then you just return the envelope with that, those funds that you're donating back. If you'd like to do this online, you can do it too. Um, if you go to westwoodchurch.net, or I think there's a, a QRL code somewhere too, but if you go to westwoodchurch.net, you'll be able to find out how to do this and do it electronically instead. Really encourage you to do this. We're gonna, they'll use this money to support our summer uh, youth trips, which are happening. We're very excited about that. That uh, there's a sort of a mini version of Rocky Mountain High happening for the high school, and our gang will be attending that. There's a work trip for our middle school, so it'll go to help support that. And uh, so I want to make you aware of that. Ask you to participate in that. We'd really appreciate it if you would do that. So uh, give you an opportunity. Well, gang, we are going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Um, really going to be praying for those uh, uh, folks who are uh, in uniform, police officers, firefighters. Um, uh, obviously, uh, folks who are members of the armed forces, we're going to really be praying for those folks this morning. But I'm also going to give you an opportunity to pray for people in your own life, too. Let's pray together. Lord, uh, again, your kindness and your graciousness, your goodness are very, very obvious. And we're so grateful for all that you have done for us. 
We're grateful that you have sent into our lives, into our country, this great free country that we're a part of. I think sometimes uh, with all the division and some of the unpleasantness that happens in our country, we forget how amazing this country is, how great it is, how wonderful the freedoms we have are. We're grateful to live in this country, Father. Grateful for those folks who lead us and grateful for those women and men in uniform who serve us as police officers, as firefighters, as EMTs. For the folks who, who serve in the armed forces, we're just very grateful. Ask for your blessing. Ask for peace in our world. Ask for protection for them. We lift that up to you. We pray for our coming vacation Bible school, Lord, that boys and girls might hear about Jesus. We're very excited to do this again after missing a year. Just help us, Father, to do the best job we can telling those boys and girls about your kindness and your love and your mercy, about the good shepherd who wants to lead them too. We lift that up to you, Lord. And now, in this moment of quiet, each of us in our own hearts and minds, we bring to you those things that, that, that we are concerned about right now. Hear the prayers of your people. Lord, every one of those prayers is precious to you. Just like every sheep in your fold is precious, we thank you that you listen and that you want to walk alongside us and lead us through mount, climbing mountains, through entering into valleys, along the still waters, that you restore our souls. You are good to us. Thank you. Amen. Well, maybe you noticed, or maybe you didn't, or maybe you don't care, uh, but I was actually out last Sunday. On Saturday, I drove to Estes Park, Colorado, to work in an event called Rogue. Rogue is a, a men's group for guys who are 40s to 60s, something like that, um, who are interested in, in knowing more about and following Jesus more passionately. Now, here's a picture of the road group that I was a part of. There it is, right up there. Um, last week, some of you actually might recognize the guy in white. That's Joe Palermo, who was a part of this congregation. He grew up in this church. And you might recognize the old guy standing next to him right there. Sort of. Yeah, it was great to spend a week with Joe, or spend a few days with Joe getting to know him again. Um, you know, the guys who attended this road group... Uh, they tended to be leaders in their individual worlds. Like, for example, I, I led a small group of this in this road group, and then the small group that I led, there was a police detective, a doctor, a therapist, an architect, and a, and a pastor. Well, during one of the large group times, I was sitting in the back, and I was kind of looking over this whole group. There were 22 of them, plus the team that worked with them, looking over this group of 22 men, uh, and I realized that they're all very, very different, but they were all also very, also all leaders in their own worlds. Very different people, very different kinds of leaders, but all leaders. Um, some of them were, were alpha male type A's. Some of them were quieter, quieter kinds of, of guys, more leaders in the background. Some were highly emotional, some not. But the one thing they all had in common, besides their desire to serve Jesus as best they could, is that they were all really leaders. Different people, different leaders, but all leaders. And it got me thinking, what do people look for in a leader? What are the characteristics 
of somebody who people really want to follow. So I did some research when I got back, um, and, I, and I read through or skimmed through several articles about the qualities people are looking for, like survey sort of articles, of the qualities people are looking for in a leader. And while there were some differences in the list, there actually were a lot of amazing similarities in the characteristics of a great leader that people were looking for. for here's a few of them. First of all, on, on many lists, and, and oftentimes first, is this, integrity. Simply put, people want to be able to trust their leader. Following somebody in anything takes a certain amount of faith, and when a leader has low integrity, it's just tough to have that kind of faith. So leaders have to prove that they're true to their word, but they also have to try hard to do what's right. That's integrity. Next is the ability to vision and strategize how to accomplish that vision. Great leaders know where they're leading their people to, and they have an idea how to get there. If you've ever followed somebody and, and realized they don't know where they're going, or, or just as bad, they know where they're going, but they don't know how to get there, you know the importance of these traits. And great leaders are also great communicators. There should never be ambiguity in what a leader communicates. People need to clearly hear from their leader, both on an informational level, but also on an emotional level. And great leaders are also self-aware. Great leaders know themselves well enough to know their own strengths and their weaknesses. They aren't arrogant about their gifts, but they don't downplay their flaws either. And lastly, on most of the lists, that it was on almost every list, is great leaders have great judgment. Great judgment. They can make reasoned, rational decisions based on fa the facts in front of them and on their experience. Now, they don't, great leaders don't always have to be right. That's not possible, right? But they can't continually be wrong either. So those are just a, a few really vital leadership traits, and there's lots of others for sure. Um, but I walk you through those, not just because I have a lifelong fascination with leadership, although that's true, but because today we're going to take a look at one more aspect of the work of Jesus in our, in our churches, in our lives, and that is Jesus as our good shepherd, our ultimate leader. So let's think about that final role of Jesus in our official worship series, Jesus, our good shepherd. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to John chapter 10. Um, we're going to read together verses uh, 11 through 16. It's page uh, 819. It's a little hard to see on the screen, sorry. Page 819 in the Bibles in your seats. Uh, or the words, of course, will be on the screen. John chapter 10, and we're going to start with verse 11. And when you found it, stand with me. Here at Westwood, we stand when God's word is read. It reminds us how important it is. It gauges our brains and our bodies together. John chapter 10, starting with 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He'll abandon the sheep because they don't belong to, him, that belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and they know me, just as my father knows me, and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, too that are not in this sheepfold, I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. God. God, we give you thanks for this teaching, this, this identification of who you are. Help us to hear your voice today, good shepherd. Amen. Have a seat. Well, this passage is part of a longer uh, and really rich section on the good shepherd in our lives. But I picked this, this particular passage because it functions sort of as a summary of the entire teaching of this aspect of the ministry of Jesus. So what exactly does it mean when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd? Well, first of all, the good shepherd is sacrificial, right? Right? The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. 
All throughout the passage on good shepherding, there is an unstated but pretty obvious comparison made between Jesus, our good shepherd, our, our very best leader, and the religious leaders of the time, the, uh, the hired hands or the poor leaders. They were the type of leaders who saw people as existing to serve them instead of they existing to serve the people. They saw themselves as being above the normal folks, certainly religiously, but also politically and socially. Now, that is not a sign of great leadership, certainly not the sign of, the, of our good shepherd. Jesus saw himself as existing to serve those God had given him, and the proof of that is the cross, right? Jesus gave everything to save us. It's not by accident that the cross is the central image of, the, of Christianity, the central symbol of Christianity. It's not by accident that the celebration of communion is the central act of worship of the Christian community. If we try to separate ourselves uh, from Christian culture just for a moment, and we really look at that, those truths, it, it becomes pretty obvious that they're, they're, that is a, a pretty oddity, isn't it? I mean, wait a minute. The, the main symbol of your faith is an instrument of torture and execution? And the central act of worship of your faith is metaphorically even eating the body and drinking the blood of your Messiah. How crazy is that? But it makes sense. If one of the things we must continually do is remind ourselves of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross on our, for our behalf. We have to live our lives as redeemed people, people who are forgiven because of the price paid by Christ. And you know what that does when we do that? Keeps us humble. Unlike the Pharisees, we don't believe we've earned God's favor. We know that Jesus earned it for us. That we have it because it's a gift. Remembering the sacrifice of the good shepherd keeps us grateful. It uh, keeps us motivated to serve. In short, we can't live our lives serving Jesus without living our lives in the shadow of the cross. Good leaders are always ready to put the needs of those they lead ahead of their own. There's a guy, a, a kind of a leadership guru, his name is Simon Sinek, and he wrote a whole book on the subject called Leaders Eat Last. Amazon's uh, summary of the book goes like this. During a conversation with the Marine Corps general, he said, officers eat last. Sinek watched as the most junior Marines ate first, while the most senior Marines took their place in the back of the line. What's symbolic in the chow hall is deadly serious on the battlefield. Great leaders sacrifice even their own survival for the good of those under their care. Well, if that's true, and I think it is, then we have the very best leader of all in Jesus, our good shepherd, because he sacrificed himself in every way possible for us. So we can trust Jesus' leadership in our lives. We can trust that Jesus told us how to live and that that way is the best way to live. He gave himself for us so we can trust in him. Our good shepherd is sacrificial, but you know what else he is? He's also loving. This is where the comparison between the true shepherd and the hired hands is made pretty clear. When trouble comes, the hired hands abandon ship, whereas the good shepherd hangs in. And that's what we need from leaders in our lives, right? We need them to care enough to hang in in tough times instead of throwing, the, throwing us under the bus to save themselves. The good shepherd stands with us. The hired hands, no. And what's the difference between the two, between the good shepherd and the hired hands? Investment. Investment that flows from ownership. Investment and ownership. Have you ever been traveling with somebody who maybe driving in a car and they hit a bump really hard or they, you know, clip a curb or whatever they do and they say, ah, no big deal, it's just a rental. Have you ever done that? I'll bet there are people in this room who have said that, right? Including your pastor probably has said that a few times. It's just a rental. What's the difference? between a rental and our own vehicles. Ownership that creates investment. 
See, Jesus bought us with a price, the price of his own body and blood, and so is invested in our good. He knows what's best for us, and he came to give us that best, to save us. Jesus summarizes the difference between the hired hands and the good shepherd with one sentence. Verse 13, he says, The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. So the message is, unlike the hired hands, the good shepherd does care about his sheep. Jesus is invested in us because he owns us. He bought us with a price. Why? Because he loves us. Because he cares about us. It was love that put Jesus on the cross. It was love that took Jesus out of the grave. And all this to say, of course we could trust in the way Jesus asks us to live our lives. Because he loves us too much to lead us astray. He's the good shepherd. And we know that he gave himself to save us. Lastly, Jesus makes the point that the good shepherd is also connected. Here's verse 14. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. Just as my father knows me, and I know my father. Think of the difference in the way that Jesus conducted his ministry and how the Pharisees conducted their lives. Jesus lived with his disciples. They walked and laughed and cried and lived together. I don't know if you uh, have been watching... Um, that television show, I can't think of the name right now, the one about Jesus and his disciples? Chosen, Chosen. yeah, thank you. If you've been watching The Chosen, um, I, I like that show for a lot of reasons, but one of the things I love about it is the way it shows the connection in Jesus and his disciples, which it, it shows that it's a very human connection. They laugh, he teases them, and yet he still is their good shepherd, clearly. Jesus was with his disciples. There was a relationship there. Jesus wasn't trying to hide behind some set of religious rules. He knew them, and he was known by them. The hired hands, the Pharisees and such, they separated themselves from the people. They believed that they were above them. They saw themselves as distinct. They lived that way. They treated people that way. In verse 16, Jesus says that his sheep hear and know his voice. Why? Because there's a connection. There's a relationship. The way a child knows the voice of their parents. God wants that much, that from us as much as anything. Relationship. God did not create us to be separate from us. Unfortunately, our sin is a separation decision. However, Jesus came and bridged that separation. And now the connection with God is there for anyone who wants to choose it. You know, verse 16 must have been um, very confusing to Jesus' listeners, certainly most, all, mostly all Jews, if not all Jewish people. Jesus said, I have other sheep too that are not in the sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. There will be one flock with one shepherd. I wonder who they thought Jesus was referring to there. I mean, they had to say to themselves, who, who are these other sheep? Who are these other sheep that the teacher is talking about? Now we know, of course, that Jesus was talking about us, the Gentiles. We who were thought not to be included in God's grace and provision actually are included because of God's love. And we can know the Savior too. We can know him we can be known by him. We, are in, we can be in relationship with him if we want. And just so we're clear about the incredible nature of that relationship with Jesus, one of my very favorite passages of Scripture describes this. Just a few chapters later, John 15. Jesus said, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything the Father told me. I mean, think of the impact on that statement of Jesus on his audience, who probably thought of themselves mostly as servants, as slaves of God, of the religious leaders, of the institutions in their lives, of Rome. And yet, here is this rebel rabbi who says, no, through me, all of you can be friends of God. 
like Enoch, like Moses, like Abraham, like David, friends of the Most High. And as astounding as that is, it applies not only to Jews, but to Gentiles also. To everybody who trusts in Jesus. That's the connection. That's what the Good Shepherd offers us. Not just authority, but loving authority. The kind of leader who has our best interests at heart. Always. But that's what great leaders are like, right? Great leaders aren't separate by position or convention from those they lead. Great leaders know who follow them, and they are known by those who follow them. There's relationship there. All great leadership, in the end, is based on relationship. And that is modeled for us as well as anything in our Good Shepherd. He's the best example of that. Knowing that, believing that, I mean, who wouldn't want to follow him? We can trust Christ because through the scripture, through the church, through our connection with Christ, we know him. We know him. We're known by him. I don't know if you've ever had a terrible boss. I've had a couple in my life. Um, I've had bosses that I never trusted. I've had bosses that nitpicked about things that didn't seem to make any real difference in my performance. But they've been pretty few. To be really honest with you, in my career, I've been really blessed to have some amazing bosses who rooted for me, who equipped me to be successful, who allowed me to make mistakes and help me learn and get better, who simply cared more about me as a person than they did about me as an employee. In short, they shepherded me. Now, it shouldn't be lost on us that the word shepherd and the word pastor are, in the New Testament anyway, the same word. And having served as a pastor for more than a few years, i got to tell you, that intimidates me. Um, um, it seems like a lot to live up to, Jesus as the great shepherd. But the truth is, no human can really live up to that level of pastoring that the good shepherd offers us. The big question, I think, uh, for all of us is, do we trust him enough to lead us? Because the sheep, as we all know, they wander off, Right? A sheep can wander off. They can, it, it can ignore the clear leading of its shepherd, and the results are almost always disastrous. But remember, the Lord is our shepherd, and we shall not want. If you believe that, if you trust that, then the way that the shepherd taught us to live, I think that should become the content of our lives. If you think about the, way, the roles that Jesus plays in our lives, and we've gone through a whole bunch of them, during this last uh, four weeks. Is there one that impacts us more on a moment-by-moment -moment basis than this? That Jesus is our good shepherd, leading us and guiding us? That makes the terrain we have to walk on not meaningless, but doable. That we can walk on tough terrain and easy terrain, keeping our eyes fixed on the shepherd, letting him lead. Will you pray with me? Lord God, I just am grateful that you are indeed are the good shepherd. And I can look back into my own life and see so many times that you led me, so many times that you just beckoned me to follow. Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. But when I did, I was never sorry. For all my friends in this room, my prayer is that you would help us to follow the good shepherd every moment every day. Amen. Well, you might have noticed that we left a little time at the end of the service, and I got to tell you something, we never do that. Um, every minute is important in a worship service, but I have a bit of an announcement to make. I, I mentioned that I was a part of this road group this last week, and one of the last couple of days of that group, the guy who leads the worship um, sang the song. It's that old uh, bird song, uh, turn, turn, turn. It's based on Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heavens. And as I listened to that song and him sing it, knowing what I wanted to share with you today, it occurred to me that that's exactly the message I want to get across because I um, have felt the season of my time here at Westwood begin to turn. 
I remember very well when I was uh, going through the interview process to become the senior pastor at Westwood, and Nelson Hyman, who I think is here somewhere, he was the chair of that search committee. And at one point, Nelson pulled me aside and he said, Scott, if you became the senior pastor at Westwood, how long do you think you could serve? And I said, Nelson, I think I've got 10 good years in me. I think I can make it 10 years. Well, it just goes to show you um, that either I... Uh, uh, underestimated my tenacity to hang in, or I overestimated my ability to find another job. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, on August 1st, I will have been the senior pastor here 24 years. 30 years total, if you count the time I spent in youth ministry. And I just think that my time here is coming to an end. Um, the truth is, I, I really do believe that Westwood would benefit from some new senior leadership. And I think I and my family would probably benefit from a different pace of life. So last week, I informed the consistory here at Westwood of my decision to retire as senior pastor at Westwood Church at the end of the calendar year. So you're not done with me yet, so don't start celebrating quite yet. December 31st of 2021 will be my last day as your senior pastor. Now, we all knew this day was going to come, and we probably knew it was coming sooner rather than later. The only difference is between now and three minutes ago, as we now know the date. So begins my lame duck season of leadership here at Westwood. But I want you to know it's not my intention to lead as a lame duck. I'm hoping to lead just the way I always have, clear up to my very last day. Um, now probably your big question is, what's next? What will happen in the search for the senior pastor, the next senior pastor? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, that's the responsibility of our executive committee and our consistory. Um, I, I really will have very little to do with it. Um, the good news is our executive committee is filled with amazing leaders who no doubt will do exactly what they should do. So if you have questions or comments about what's next, I would point you to them. Paula Aguilar is our vice president. Dave MacGyver is our clerk. The rest of the executive committee is Chris Vanderswag, Todd Skiderman, and Don Stapleton. I would encourage you to feel free to communicate uh, your questions or your comments to them. Now, after uh, my season actually does turn here at the end at Westwood, I'll still have to have a job of some sort. My wife uh, will want me out of the house and will want me to bring in a certain amount of uh, funds. So just want a, a public service announcement here. If you know anyone looking for an older guy who lacks any real skills and has <laughs> fairly shaky motivation, let me know. I might have just the guy for you. Okay, that's probably enough for today. Stand up with me, will you? Let's end with this with a blessing. We've been talking about the great shepherd of the sheep. May the Lord... May Jesus, who is the great shepherd of the sheep, hold you in his loving care this week and always. May it be so. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, next week is Vacation Bible School Sunday. Come on back because we're going to launch a great week of Vacation Bible School. You'll want to be here. Thanks for being here this morning. Oh!